We're in week two of this series called Keep It Simple. We're studying through the book of Colossians and we're learning what Paul writes to this new Christian church that got started in a place called, this is gonna bother me, a place called Colossae. You would be hard pressed to find a more Jesus-centered New Testament letter than the book of Colossians. It's all about Jesus. Today we're gonna be looking at eight verses together, but before we get into that, I just wanna read the, the theme verse for this series from Colossians 2, verse eight. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. So again, what was taking place is they were kind of adding things to the gospel message. And Paul is saying, don't get taken captive by that. Stay focused on Jesus. So today we're gonna be looking at verses 15 through 23. And as you might be turning there, I want you to be considering this question. And as you leave here today, you might ask this question in the car on the way home or maybe over the lunch table, or sometime this week, you might revisit this question. Here's the question, what is the most important thing you can know? What is the most important thing you can know? A lot of times we might ask the question, what's the most important thing? I wanna ask, what's the most important thing you can know right now? What piece of information, what bit of knowledge, what truth, what's the most important thing that you can know in your life right now? Now through various stages of life, we might think that would change through a season of difficulty or a season of parenting or single life, married life, or whatever it may be. It would probably, to answer that question right now at first glance would probably be a different response for many of us in the room. Somebody might say, well, the most important thing for me to know right now is, is uh, what kind of job could I find because I really need a job. Somebody might ask, well, where am I gonna go to college? because I need to go to college, or what am I gonna major in? What's my degree gonna be? Somebody might even ask the question, what's the secret to a woman's mind? (laughs) Because I need a woman. What would it be for you? What is the most important thing for me to, some of you are smiling and you're gonna be in trouble later. uh, I might be in trouble later, I don't know. Uh, But here's the thing, there needs to be an authoritative truth. There needs to be a a bit of information that covers all perspectives and opinions and life experiences and maturity or, or even seasons that we're in. And that's what the book of Colossians is about. Four chapters, 95 verses. As Chris mentioned last week, you can read it in about 10 minutes. And Paul is writing to these new Christians. He's giving them information about what is the most important thing for you to know right now or forever for that matter. Acts chapter 19, if you were to go there, you would read about uh, Paul spending two years in Ephesus, and he's preaching the gospel message. Again, last week, Chris told you that the gospel message, as simple as we can put it, the good news that Jesus Christ solved the problem of sin through his death, burial, and resurrection. We're saved by grace through him. That's the gospel message. And so people from all over Asia Minor, they come to Ephesus to hear Paul preaching. In verse 10, it says this. This, is, this went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Let that sink in for just a minute. All the Jews and the Greeks in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. And if Paul were standing here today, he would tell you there were mixed reviews. You can read the next few verses. Some people got it, some people didn't. Some people laughed, some people scoffed, some people were excited about it. I'm sure some people rolled their eyes at it. Verse 20 It says this, there were people that responded to it, and this way the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. So in spite of that, it did take root. So people returned to their hometowns all over Asia Minor, shared the gospel, and churches began to spring spring up. Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus addresses seven churches. Those churches came about because of Paul's preaching in Ephesus. It was a fruitful time in his ministry. And so one of the people in attendance, one of the people that heard the gospel preached was a man by the name of Epaphras. To be clear, Ephesus is a city, Epaphras is a man, don't get the two confused. But while Paul is teaching in Ephesus, at some point Epaphras hears him preach, is convicted, accepts the gospel message, and he's going to make his way back home. 
probably has a backyard barbecue, <laughs> invites over his friends and family and coworkers and neighbors and, and shares the gospel message with them. And if he were here today, I'm confident he would say mixed reviews. Some people got it, some people didn't. Some people were excited about it, some people scoffed, and some people rolled their eyes at it. You get the point. That's what happens when you share the gospel message. There are mixed reviews, but there were enough people that responded to it, and so a church springs up in Colossae, and some great things begin happening. There's a lot to be grateful for, and Paul hears about this. What I, what I want you to understand is Paul is kind of like the grandfather of this church. He never visited there. He never spoken with them directly, but because he shared the gospel with Epaphras, now others had responded, and so there's simply, something deeply concerning for Epaphras happening. And so he doesn't feel, for some reason or another, doesn't feel like he has the authority or the leverage or the influence or the clout to deal with it. And so he goes to Paul, travels the thousand miles to Rome where Paul's in prison and says, Paul, I need you to write a letter to them. I need you to tell them some things that I've been telling them, but I need you to back it up. They need to hear it from you, Paul. I need you to leverage your authority and your influence and your clout, your, your reputation, your apostleship because they're just not getting it when I'm telling them. Any of you parents of teenagers, either now or at some point in the past, and if you're not yet, beware, um, any of you parents of teenagers know how this works. You can tell something to your child and you can tell them several different ways. And they may or may not listen. But this is what happens. Somebody maybe hipper or cooler than you or just different or maybe they have a better beard than you. Uh, I heard last week he said it's, he has a better beard there. I was like, what beard? Uh, anyway. Somebody else comes along and they tell them the exact same thing. And your kid's like, hey, mom, hey, dad, did you... I just, I think this is what I'm going to do about it. And you're thinking, well, I've been telling you that for weeks or months or, okay, whatever it takes. You know, I think that's what's happening here. Epaphras is saying, Paul, I've been telling them this, but I need you to tell them. And so Paul writes to them. And throughout this letter, he's going to use this pattern of encouraging and warning and encouraging and warning the church there. And his warning kind of comes in two waves. It's like a boxer dismantling his opponent in the ring about them being discouraged and confused and Paul's going to say, hey, I want to build you up in this gospel of grace. So the first thing that Paul goes after is the Roman Empire. For some reason, I don't understand it personally, but for some reason, the people back then came to this, this point where they believed that the government could provide for all of their needs and take care of them. And that the government would always be in place and they, they could trust in Rome and it would be there forever. And I don't know why they got that idea. We don't have that idea, right? I mean, we're smarter than that, right? But Paul is saying, hey, you've been trusting in the Roman Empire, and you need to stop that. You need to put your trust in Jesus, in Christ alone. It's kind of like when you go to the ocean, and you know the waves kind of come beating against your feet, and you're standing there, just standing there in the sand, enjoying the, the water. What happens? Well, if you just stand there and you don't move, eventually the sand kind of gets eroded out from under you. You're going to have a difficulty standing strong. And Paul is saying, hey, you've stepped into this, this, these waves coming at you from the Roman culture. And if you're not careful, if you just stand there, you're going to have difficulty continuing to stand. The advantage that we have 2,000 years later is Rome is no more. We have some roads. We have some walls. We have the movie Gladiator, right? But Paul is saying, Quit. come on, it's a great movie. Quit putting your hope in Rome. The application for us today is what are you putting your hope in? What are you putting your hope in? Second thing that Paul is going to work to dismantle is this idea of syncretism. Again, syncing up, bringing in other ideas, adding to the gospel message. The Colossians lived in this Greek society, and the Greeks were hungry for knowledge, drunk on knowledge. And so, you know, I, I can picture them showing up at this new Colossian church saying, so what, what is it that you guys believe again? Well, we believe that we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Well, wait a minute. What, there's got to be more to it than that. I, surely that's not it. Hey, can, come over here. Hear, hear what these people believe. I mean, can you, can you imagine this? I mean, maybe they even took a video of them and threw it on social media or something, poking fun at them. Bless their little hearts. Isn't this cute? 
what they believe? Maybe you've experienced some of that in life as well. And the Greeks were probably saying, hey, well, I'm glad you love Jesus. It's great you love Jesus. You can love Jesus by all means, be for Jesus, but you can't honestly tell me that it's only Jesus and Jesus alone. There's got to be Jesus and something else. And Paul is saying, no, it's Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Keep it simple. So with Colossians, he begins this task of communicating the, the supremacy, superiority, the centrality of Jesus Christ alone. So we're going to look at verses 15 through 23 today. If you take notes in your Bible, I would encourage you, go back actually to verse 9. And from verse 9 down through verse 23 of Colossians chapter 1, in the original language, that is one long sentence. One long run-on sentence. So Paul is in the section today we're going to take a look at. He is going to unleash an avalanche of statements about the identity of Jesus Christ. I would go as far as to say this is the clearest, this is the greatest paragraph in all the Bible that communicates who Jesus Christ is. So in essence, good news for us, um, bad news for me, in essence, this is kind of the peak of the book of Colossians. This is the summit of the book of Colossians. It's all downhill from here, and we're only in week two, okay? So you'll, Chris will have to figure that out next week. Um, I'm going to cheer on my son next week. Sorry. Four ways that Jesus is supreme. That's what Paul does in this section. Number one, Jesus is supreme in creation. Jesus is supreme in creation. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. The first thing that, that I want to pull out of that is Jesus makes the invisible God visible. Scripture is clear. God is invisible because God is spirit. John chapter 4, verse 24. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. In Exodus, we're going to bounce around a lot today, have a lot of ground to cover. Exodus 33 you don't have to turn there, but there's this strange interaction between God and Moses. And God tells Moses, I'm going to walk by you, Moses, but you can't look at me. And it's not because Moses wasn't able to look at God, but because Moses couldn't handle looking at God. And so God sticks Moses in kind of the, the cleft of a rock and shields his eyes, kind of like you'd shield your kid's eyes on a very sunny day. Don't look at the sun, that sort of thing. And it doesn't say God walked by Moses. It said it says God's glory passes by Moses. And as he passes by him, he, he kind of lifts up his hand, and all Moses could see was God's back. There's, there's something amazing about that. God said you wouldn't be able to handle it. Well, Paul in Colossians says, if you want to know what God is like, if you want to see what God is like, if you want to hear God's tone, if you want to know what God cares about, what God gets angry about, what God loves, you don't have to speculate just look to Jesus. Jesus is the visible expression of the invisible God. John the Baptist introduces Jesus at the beginning of the Gospel of John. He says this in verse 18 of chapter 1. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father. He's made him known. Jesus said this of himself in chapter 14, verse 9 of the Gospel of John. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the writer says this, The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact rep representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. And so Paul says over and over and over again, the reason that Jesus is sufficient to save is that He is God in the flesh. The next thing I want to draw out of this section is Jesus came to show us our future. When God created man and woman, the Bible says in Genesis 1, 27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That means we, we are created to reflect in physical expression the character, the essence of God who, is, who, who on this earth, it, we're here to steward this creation. 
He created us with his character, with his essence in, in us. I'm an amazing privilege. But then sin comes along. And I, I, maybe visually, I just want to give you an idea to run with today. How many of you have ever thrown a, a rock or a baseball through a window? Accidentally, on purpose, whatever. Be honest. I mean, anybody, a few of you? Um, is, it can be kind of fun, right? Um, but what are you left with? Well, you're left with broken glass all over the ground. And that's the picture I, I want you to run with today as we're considering sin. You have this perfect glass, this perfect image of God in you, and sin has come along, and it's broken that image. It's shattered it within you. Can you still, still reflect God's character? Of course you can. Absolutely. Are you still, um, do you still have good intentions within you? Of course you do. Are you still drawn towards God? Absolutely. But no more than that shattered glass on the ground can still reflect and refract light from the sun. Not in its fullness. Not as it was intended to. Jesus came to reveal to us also what God is like. We'll circle back around to the, the shattered glass. Jesus came to reveal to us what God is like. Also what God has predestined, what God has planned for those of us whose lives are hidden in Christ. In Colossians 3, Paul says that responding to the gospel is like hiding your life in Jesus. He's the only one who can reassemble the shattered image of God within you. That's what it means when it says that Jesus is fully God. The next thing Paul talks about in that section is he's the firstborn over all creation. Now, I, um, I try to be very careful about speaking negatively about other, um, other churches, but there is a, there's a movement out there that would talk about this verse and say, see, right there, that verse right there, that means that Jesus was created. He was, he was firstborn. That God and the Holy Spirit one day, they got together and they said, hey, something's missing here. We need a third part to the Trinity, and so let's create the Son. All in favor, say I. I, I, okay, here we go. Some beliefs would tell you that, but that's not what this word means. It's not what the word means in the, in the original language. The original Greek, this word used here that's translated for us, firstborn, I would argue maybe a faulty translation, it doesn't mean the first to be born into a family. It doesn't mean the created one. It means existed before anything. Supreme over. First in rank and privilege. Jesus has the authority over all creation. In him all things are created. It came through him. Now it's important to remember as you read this letter and other New Testament epistles as well is there's a, there's a primary audience and a secondary audience taking place here. The primary audience, of course, is the, the Colossian Christians. They just responded to the gospel, and so they're hearing from Paul. They've been discouraged and confused, and Paul is encouraging them and trying to clarify some things. The secondary audience, those are the, the Greek intellectuals. Paul had to have known they're going to be looking over their shoulders. They're going to be reading it as well. And so Paul is saying, hey, Jesus created everything here. He's the only one. Jesus is the only one who has the right to say, this is mine, and it's not selfish or immature. So what that means for us is your search for meaning and purpose in life, and what am I here for? It's always going to be frustrating to you until you find it in Jesus alone. So Jesus is before all things. Not only does he outrank everyone, but he predates us. He is infinite in nature. We're finite beings. So we think about that, and if you're not careful, your, your mind might blow up. What does that mean? He has no start date. He has no ending date. He is infinite. He's always been. He just is. And because of that, he has some say in all of this. Now, we do understand that principle. I mean, you remember being in uh, preschool or, or grade school, and someone would say, hey, it's time for uh, recess. There's refreshments over there, over there on the table. And this group of kids takes off sprinting. And the first one there, he gets the cupcake, right, the big one. Well, why does he get the cupcake? Well, because he was here first. Or you, you're going on a ride with some friends. Shotgun, why do you get to sit in the front? Because I called it first. i, I got to tell you this. Um, Several years ago, when we were in Mexico, I was running some errands one day in Mexico City, and I stopped at a McDonald's there. 
and I'm waiting in McDonald's. I'm about four or five people back, and I'm just going to figure out what I'm going to get, and uh, this Mexican lady steps right in front of me. And I was like, well, that's kind of odd. And so I nicely tapped her on the shoulder, and I said, uh, hi, I was uh, actually standing here in line first, and she turns around and looks at me, and in Spanish she says, actually, I was in this country first. <laughs> and... Uh, by all means, um, listen, disclaimer, we had a wonderful time living in Mexico, a great appreciation for the people, the culture, the food. Our experience there was, was awesome. So don't leave here today and, and base anything on that, that statement. But the, what gives you the right? Well, I was here first. Jesus is over all creation. He was here first. He holds all things together, Paul says. Once again, I... This is a swing at the Greek intellectuals. The Greeks love to talk about this. What is it that holds everything together? What is it that, what matter, what, what is it that's holding everything together? And Paul is saying, hey, Jesus holds everything together. His person holds everything together. I would tell you this, maybe you can relate. I understood this much more after I got married. Got married and started having kids. And you know, I don't know how it's been in your home, but uh, especially when the kids were younger, when my wife would get sick or she would, it was pretty rare, but she would go on a trip by herself or something, the wheels would come off. I, again, especially when the kids were younger, there was, there was crying, there was pouting, there was, and I'm not even talking about the kids. It was just, it was ugly, you know. <laughs> my wife holds our home together. She just, she does. She has a knack for that. Paul is saying the person of Jesus holds all of this together. Here's the second thing that Paul says. Jesus is supreme over the church. Verse 18, he's supreme over the church. He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. The reason why Paul would bring this up is he's saying, hey, Jesus' jurisdiction goes well beyond creation. It goes right into the church. So hey, Colossian church, you're frustrated because the Romans are you know, attacking you. The Greek culture is influencing you. You're worried about where things are going to end. Stop living in fear. Jesus is the head of the church. He's got this. Jesus has supremacy. He says he's highly distinguished. He's the first. He has superior status. What Paul means by that is Jesus is the first one to take on the grave and win. He reveals to us not only who God is, but what God has planned for those of us whose lives are hidden in Christ. Romans chapter 6, words from Paul elsewhere. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. He is supreme. He has conquered death. And he used that to reconcile us with the Father. Here's the third thing Paul says. Jesus is supreme because of the cross. Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus had the fullness of God. Another swing at the Greek intellectuals, again, because they were fine giving parts of him, but not the fullness of him. So in the past, we know God's presence maybe dwelled on a mountaintop or in a, in a, a tabernacle, in a tent, but Paul says it resides in Jesus Christ. The fullness of God resides in Christ. Jesus reconciles all things. He says there's, there's no one like Jesus. He has unique access to God because he is God in human form. And so instead of leveraging his power, his influence for his own fame, for his own good, he does that for us to reconcile us to God. In fact, don't miss this key truth today. On the cross, Jesus' shed blood satisfied God's justice and it demonstrated his mercy. He has all kinds of clout. He's got all kinds of leverage. And he says, I'm going to use that to reconcile you to God. This message is all about Jesus. You know, one of my daughters, she loves to kind of put hash marks on how many times I get off track, you know, on her sermon notes. I, I almost was going to challenge her how many times I said Jesus today because the message, Jesus is supreme. 
Number four, Jesus is supreme for his creatures, for his creation. And let me prepare you, the first few verses are are not all that flattering as they have been. Verses 21 through 23. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now, it turns the corner, but now he's reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that's been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Alienated, I I probably don't need to go into depth, but you can imagine it's it's an awful word. You're estranged. You're isolated. You're, you're, You're aside. You're withdrawn. He says you're enemies in mind. You're hostile, unreceptive, argumentative. Maybe you're listening, but the whole time you're thinking, yeah, I don't, I, I don't agree with that. I'm pushing back. I'm, I'm arguing. I, I don't like this. He also says your evil behavior. It's 2018. I, I don't know very many people that say, um, I struggle with evil behavior. No, we say, well, ah, nobody's perfect. I'm, I got my struggles. I make mistakes. I don't, I don't always do good. Paul says your evil behavior Evil means living your life opposite of which God had intended. So Paul says, I'm I'm reminding you, again, of the supremacy, the centrality, the sufficiency of Jesus Christ to save. So he's writing to these Colossians, and really the question that Paul is asking them and answering is, what is the most important thing that you can know? And unapologetically, he says, your understanding of Jesus who he is, what he's done, what he will do when he returns. Your understanding of Jesus is the most important thing you can know. And I would say that to you today. Doesn't matter what you're facing. Doesn't matter what trials you're going through. It doesn't matter the pain that you're facing. Your understanding of Jesus is the most important thing that you can know. And I didn't think you'd get too excited about that. I kind of figured this would be the reaction. Because we've become a very logical, practical, pragmatic people. You know, Seth, um, I'm pretty certain that my, uh, my wife is going to leave me this week. And you're telling me that the most important thing that I can know is who Jesus is? I'm drowning in finances. I don't know how we're going to pay our bills this month or feed our family. And wait, you're trying to tell me that the most important thing that I can know is who Jesus is? I'm suffering over here. So just forgive me. I, I kind of find it hard to believe and even a little bit insulting that you're telling me the most important thing I can know is who Jesus is. And so as deeply and compassionately and as pastorally as I can say it, if I could just pull you up out of the circumstances of everyday life for just a moment and remind you of what the big picture is, what is really at stake here, the reason why your marriage is falling apart, the reason why you're drowning in finances, the reason why you're suffering is because the image of God has been shattered within you and within the person sitting next to you. And until we can identify the real root of the problem, you're gonna continue to put Band-Aids on superficial, important, but superficial issues. We've gotta get at the root. And so this is why knowing who Jesus is and what he has done for you and what he will do when he returns, this is why that is the most important thing that you can know. Because, again, until you get that right, you're going to continue to struggle with figuring it out. I know right now there are people in the room, I've I've spoken to you, and you've been coming for a while, and you've heard the gospel message. You, you, You know what we teach about Jesus. You may have even come to a point of belief and said, yeah, you know what, I, I agree with that, but for some reason or another, you've not stepped over that line 
You've not made that decision to accept Jesus as Savior and Lord in your life. You've not made the decision to be baptized for some reason or another. And I, I, I know that you've got legitimate questions. I know you have painful experiences and difficult memories that you're wrestling with. And maybe you're not even against it. You're just kind of on the fence. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not against it. I'm not really for it yet either. I want you to understand something about the gospel, and this might be the first time you've heard this. Of course, the gospel means the good news. But when you look at the original language as well, the word gospel comes from a Greek compound word meaning proclamation of joy. So it's, you're sharing the good news. It's a proclamation of joy. And don't mishear me now. It, it's, it's not a proclamation of truth or of absolutes or secure faith, but a proclamation of joy. So what that means is when you understand who Jesus is, when you understand what he's done for you, what he, the relationship he wants to have with you, the only response to the gospel is joy. And so if you, if you don't have joy about the gospel message, it might be a red flag for you. There have been times in my past where someone would ask me and say, hey, are you, are you a Christian? Of course I'm a Christian. Well, why are you a Christian? Well, I don't want to go to hell. I mean, the Bible says that if, if I don't have a relationship with Jesus, that I, I'm going to go to hell. I, I don't want to go to hell. I mean, if I were really honest, I might say, hey, I, I know, I know that I, I know that I don't love Jesus as much as I should, but I do love him. I, I know that I don't hunger for his word as much as I should, but, but I am steadying a little bit here and there. But you know what? I want what's best for me, and if there's pain involved, I don't want any part of that. So no, I don't want to go to hell. Many of us treat the gospel kind of like an insurance policy. And we sign up and we cross the line and we, we do what we're supposed to do and then we're just kind of waiting things out. Someone might ask us, if, I'm a, if you're a Christian, if I'm a Christian, we'd tell them, yes, I believe in God, but there's, there's nothing about that that's joyful. You did what you did out of duty. A lot of times we treat accepting the gospel message kind of like buying a used car from a car lot. I have to clarify, how many of you have had a wonderful experience buying a used car from a car lot? You're the exceptions. Okay, all right. Most of the time it's like, I'll come up to your price if you'll come down to my price. What's it going to cost me? What are the damages? It's all about the, the, what it's going to cost. And if we're not careful, that's how we approach the gospel message. What's the damage going to be? And if there's not joy in that, when culture comes your way, when difficult circumstances come your way, you're going to be tempted to give up. Let's just say that you have a friend who is dying of a terminal disease. And you go to the doctor and the doctor says, uh, does some studies and comes back and says, hey, I, I have an answer for you. And we can take care of this and you can live a long life and you can enjoy life and, and married and and." raise your grandkids and just have a wonderful time. But after this treatment, no more chocolate. And you're excited. This is awesome. This is amazing. But your friend, the whole while, is getting more and more perturbed. Finally, what's going on? No chocolate? Are you kidding me? I talk to people all the time and they're like, <laughs> You know, I, I've been told, I, I know what you're saying is true, but I've been told that if I become a Christian, I'm not supposed to have sex before marriage. No chocolate. Not for you. Well, I, I've been told that being a Christian means that I've got to change my political views. I've been told that being a Christian means I can't get drunk anymore. You know, some Christians would even say that can't drink at all. I've been told that if I become a Christian, then it means I have to feel guilty about having any money or wealth from now on. I've been told that becoming a Christian means I have to dismiss science. If your understanding of becoming a Christian is all about the things you, you can't or shouldn't do, there's no joy in that. There's nothing in that that reflects the joy of the gospel, the power of the gospel, the grace of the gospel. It's boiled down to a list of do's and don'ts. And some of you are, are rejecting Christianity, not because of Jesus, but because of your questions, your circumstances, your experiences, your pain, or other Christians. And Paul says to these Colossians, you, you looked to Jesus once, 
but now you're getting caught up by everything that's going on all around him. You're looking at the people around him and the Christians around him. And, you know, keep looking at him. And some people, we, we do that sometimes. We look at other Christians and we think, well, I, I could never be that. I could never become that. I could never measure up to that. Or, or I don't want to be like that. Because let's be honest, there's some weird Christians out there, right? And Paul is saying, keep it simple. Look to Jesus. You're making something else supreme in your life. Look to Jesus. In fact, Paul would say this, it's impossible to see the supremacy of Jesus Christ if anything else is supreme. I've talked to people who have said, well, my biggest objection to Christ is I I don't know what I would look like after becoming a Christian. I mean, I don't know if they think that Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith are going to show up with the little light clicker thingy and they're just going to forget everything about their past. You know, your identity, God, God created who you are. He created your, your, your personality, your sense of humor, your style. He doesn't want to take that away from you. He wants to redeem it. It's very different. And so when you consider that, the, the response to the gospel is joy. The key to a joyful response is being confident in Christ. It doesn't mean, well, I I finally got all my questions answered, so I'm ready to step across the line. It doesn't mean I'm I'm confident in the, the details of the gospel. I'm confident in religion. It means I'm confident in Christ and who he is and what he's done for me and what he will do when he returns. Paul says, this is it. There's nothing else. Keep it simple. Stay focused on Jesus because the shattered image of God within you can only be put back together through the sacrifice and the ongoing mediation of Jesus Christ. It bridges the gap between you and God. It brings that relationship back together. It reconciles you. That's it. John 14, 6. Scripture is very implicit, unapologetic. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, there's probably nothing more controversial in our world today than for you to stand up and say, Jesus is the only way to God. In fact, it's probably one of the few things that our very tolerant culture will not tolerate is for you to say, Jesus is the only way to God. I... I, I don't get it. It's almost as if there's this, uh, this preferential thing, but here's, here's the deal. We're not talking about, you know, Red Robin versus Freddy's. We're not talking about Qdoba versus Chipotle here. It's not a preference, but that's oftentimes the way the world sees it is, is well, I prefer this over that, and they're offended because they're saying, there's no way that you can tell me that other belief systems are inferior. I'm not saying other belief systems are inferior. By saying that Jesus is the only way to God, it is saying that other systems of belief are irrelevant. Consider this for a moment. Um, I'm happy the Broncos came back last last week and they uh, held on and won against the Seahawks. But let's imagine today at some point during the game against the Raiders that the commentator comes on and he says, you know, um, they've got a good start to this season But I really think what would make all the difference in the world is if they signed Seth Thomas out of Grand Junction, Colorado. Six foot two, never played football in his life, but uh, he's an incredible mountain biker, great family. I think he would would bring what it takes to the team to get us to the Super Bowl this year. I appreciate your laughter, by the way. Thank you for the support. (laughs) It's silly, right? It's ridiculous. It's irrelevant. Jesus is the only one with the capability, the power to reform that broken and shattered image of God within you. And so he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but through me. There is no other thing. And you might be thinking, Seth, I've heard all this before. I've been coming to church for, forever. Can we talk about something else? There is no other thing. Romans 1.25 They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. They worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. That's what we do. A lot of times I try to fix the shattered image of God within me. I promise you we're just about done. I am going a little long today and I apologize. But a lot of times we try to fix that on our own. 
I'm going to do it by trying to find that fulfillment in creation. I'm going to seek out. I'm going to pursue. And so that's where I would propose you don't have a lust problem. You have a worship problem. You're worshiping the wrong thing. You feast on lust. It's like having a meal of cotton candy. It tastes great for about 30 seconds, and then after that you feel like junk, right? You don't have a, a greed problem. You have a worship problem. You're trying to reassemble the shattered image of God within you by going after another purchase, another new car, another, another investment, whatever it may be. You don't have an anger problem. You have a worship problem. Things didn't go your way, and so you get frustrated and angry and desperate. Sin has broken the image of God within you, and the only way to put it back together is through Jesus. Here's the takeaway this week. We're going to come in for a quick stop. Read Isaiah 53 and Colossians 1 several times this week. Probably take you 10 to 15 minutes. I want to encourage you, read Isaiah 53, Colossians 1 several times this week, and ask yourself the question, what is the most important thing I know? What is the most important thing I know? I would hope that your focus on Jesus would bring about righteousness, that your focus on Jesus would bring about goodness, that your focus on Jesus would bring about justification in your life. My prayer through this series, through this message today, is that maybe for the first time, or again, your faith would be ignited, reignited. Jesus is supreme. Stay focused on him. Keep it simple. If you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, then, then start in the Gospel of John. Go from there. Jump over to Mark. Read Matthew. Read Luke. Ask somebody else that's been down this road ahead of you for some help. Stay focused on Jesus. In a moment, I'm, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to take communion. After that, we're going to close with a song. But here's what I want you to think about. The third point we talked about, Jesus is supreme because of the cross. Because of his sacrifice on the cross, Jesus' shed blood satisfied God's justice. It demonstrated God's mercy. Again, God loved the world so much that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him could have eternal life. Jesus used his power to reconcile you to God. Let's pray.